Hey, what's up guys? It's Rico here, back with another one, but this time it's a webinar one. Uh, we hosted a webinar a couple months ago on the four steps to find a Chinese manufacturer, the same steps that my company uses for Swain Asia that we've developed over the last 10 years. And it was so popular, we decided to do another, another one. So this is gonna be December 12th, December 13th. So if you're in East Coast time, that would be December 12th, 8 p.m. and then 8 a.m. the next day, December 13th. If you're in Southeast Asia, and most of Europe, it's mostly gonna be December 13th. So there'll be one webinar in the morning on December 13th and another one evening on December 13th. So the link is in the description below to show you all the time zones. And like I said, this is on the four steps that we used to find Chinese manufacturers. The difference between this webinar and the last one is that we had so much Q&A on the last one. We had 25 minutes on the last one at the end that told me that people wanted a little bit more crowd interaction. So in this webinar we're gonna be doing, at the end of each section of the presentation, we are going to be having a live Q&A in between before I move on to the next section. So it's almost gonna be like, the presentation itself will be there, the value, but then there's also going to be sort of a live consultation that you get from me, personalized consultation for free. So definitely wanna see you guys there. Like I said, it's December 12th, December 13th. Link is in the description below. We're also gonna have a special Christmas bonus for people that attend the webinar. What's up YouTube? My name is Rico, I'm the CEO of Source for Asia, host of the Made in China podcast and host of the Source for Asia YouTube channel. Back with another one. This is more gonna be like a video cast. So in this video cast, if you haven't watched the first one that I did with Luke, which is his onboarding interview. This is the exit interview as he's leaving on a, a flight, technically tomorrow morning, but tonight. So uh, I guess, I mean, the obvious question would be like, what, how different has the internship been to what you expected? And obviously the first interview we did, you had like, you'd been here for like a week, experienced a little bit of China, but spent a month in China, almost two months in the Philippines. So what's, um, what's your overall assessment, I guess? Um, I mean, I'm leaving later on today but it, it doesn't feel like I am like it hasn't sunk in like at all and it'll probably only sink in like once two, you arrive in Canada. once I arrive in Canada and yeah. settled in and actually get back home um, but I guess overall um, I was thinking about this today it's just like the past like I don't even know how long it's been because it's like so much stuff has happened and whereas like back home like all the blades days kind of blend into one and here it's just like one day could be like stories for a lifetime you know it almost <laughs> kind of feels like that yeah we, we have we have a couple we had a couple days that would definitely <laughs> definitely a story worth forever yeah uh, you know some things we can't talk about on the podcast but you know uh, you've definitely experienced the full gamut of like the travel the well maybe maybe if we spent a little bit more time in China it's just that I already had like this travel plan and your internship technically started a month late yeah. Um, but my original plan was actually to do two months in China and then one month here or in Thailand. It ended up being inverted because my, my plan was once you, once you left, I was going to come to the Philippines for two months. Yeah. Um, so anyways, it ended up working out differently. But still, I think, you know, the, the, the stuff that was crucial for China was getting the content in factories, yeah. on the factory floor stuff, my first year in China. Yeah. But, you know, obviously I'm spending more time here, so it actually did make sense for you to be here and then for us to do things like webinars and all the videos that we've been recording. Like, I mean, those drone videos, like, fuck, man, that's gold. But then also each one of those videos is like one to two gigabytes. Imagine uploading six of those in, in Guangzhou, you know, it's oh, so, yeah. so difficult to do that. Um, but yeah, you definitely fully experienced the full gamut in terms of a little bit of China, factory life, office life in China, 
uh, general life in China, made, met some business contacts in China, then Hong Kong, you almost forgot about Hong Kong. You experienced Hong Kong, you met people there, you got to travel around Hong Kong, then obviously the Philippines, business contacts here, it's sort of different life, and then also fucking mini vacation in Boracay, and then partying as well in these uh, Manila streets. So, so I think you, you experienced the full spectrum, full spectrum. Um, what would you say is like your uh, biggest takeaway in terms of the differences between Guangzhou and, and Manila? Um, there's, there's obvious things like open internet and things like that, uh, lower cost of living, which I've talked about before. But you know, from a business climate, uh, what, what's, what's your overall takeaway? I mean, the business climate in Guangzhou, you can tell it's fast moving. Yeah. Um, you can tell there's a lot of opportunities to be had. But at the same time, you're also really restricted by the language barrier. Um, and a lot of the people that I met and the network, like the connections I made there are people either who had started their businesses like a while ago or are working kind of on the fringes and like relying on those Chinese connections too. Yeah. Um, or are, are sourcing, you know, or are doing something in the product business. Whereas like if you came to a spot like Manila, the ceiling of what you can do is much higher, in my opinion, just because there's that language barrier, but also people are also just more open to different ideas, different concepts. Um, and yeah, I think that's my um, would be my biggest first impressions of the two cities. What biggest uh, takeaway from this China as a whole? I mean, I've said this before to you, and I told it to a couple of people, like, you can't understand China. Like, I had my ideas of China, but you don't understand it till you go there. Um, and, yeah, it's just, it's so big, it's so huge, it's just so different that you really can't, I can't explain it um, until, a, like, one goes there and spends a significant amount of time there. I only spent a month there, but yeah, I think, you know, like, I got a pretty good feel of how it is and and stuff like that, but yeah, I mean it's a month, but it's also an accelerated month, right? Because, yeah, exactly. Because you're like you're with me, whereas a lot of people, um, if they go to China for the first time, you're gonna spend a lot of time like just figuring out logistics, yeah, and just like your basic needs, you know. Yeah. Whereas if you show up and you already have an apartment, you just get your bank account set up the next well, next week. WeChat set up same day, like yeah. all these little things that usually take people two, three weeks to, oh, to yeah. get established, you skip. So then of course then you had a, you had a chance to like get fucking custom suits or custom shirts rather, uh, go check out the Shenzhen market, go to a factory, yeah. like there's a lot of different things. Um, if you see a little bit of China nightlife, meet, like you mentioned, entrepreneurs, Chinese people, Chinese entrepreneurs, expat entrepreneurs. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of an accelerated thing. I would say like you probably experienced three to six months of what people experience in, <laughs> in China. Yeah. The only pro the only thing that you didn't get to do, which I would have liked to, if, if you had come before, it would have been maybe to travel with me to northern China. Yeah. To give you just a, a completely different perspective on Guangzhou as a whole, because you know if you see Guangzhou and Shenzhen, you have this perception that when you go to a place like Nantong, which I've spent a lot of time in. It's like a tiny city, but there's the population is still six million people. Yeah, it's kind of weird, you know. So it's, it's a strange thing the way China sort of compacts people in that way. Um, what about biggest uh, takeaway from the Philippines as a whole? Uh, biggest takeaway from the Philippines is just the network, and then meeting a lot of those people and talking to them, and just being able to real like. For me, it's, it's been like eye-opening and like shaping what I want to do in the future, but also just realizing the potential that a place like Southeast Asia has as a whole if you're an entrepreneur. Um, and then, you know, there's definitely some added perks to that, like being like being able to film all the content and just being able to soak up as much knowledge as I can from you, but also spending a lot of time with Mike and, and all this recording different material like it's it's been really beneficial in that way too in hong kong hong kong meeting nick zebra was definitely one of the highlights for me uh just a really cool individual and then meeting guys like evan and ro alan um just, you know all these people that i've seen in in your videos but also uh, just really nice people and just like realizing that they're they're just like everyone else 
to a certain extent, and like, yeah, they're just like everyone else to a certain extent, but also they're it, like seeing the other side and just being like, oh, they're trying to make it too and figuring it out too. And that's just part of the journey too, which is really cool. Yeah, I mean, I always talk about that. Like, well, I used, I still talk about that, but I used to talk about it a lot more in my first year of doing podcasts and stuff like that, because I was just like, look, like, I'm not, well, at the time I would say, like, I'm not so much more advanced than, you know, other people that are trying to get their start in China, but I'm a little bit ahead. So, like, it's good to connect with people that are not too far away from you. Yeah. Because it gives you an idea of, like, what the next six months to a year would look like. Whereas, um, if you're learning from people that are, you know, 10 years ahead of you, yeah. it's kind of hard to see what the most practical steps, the next steps are. Um, so, I think the cool thing about my network is, while some of these guys are very experienced in, in different fields, um, specifically from an entrepreneurship standpoint, like, Zebra has been involved with Entrepreneur for two years, right? So you still kind of like, even though it's accelerating really quickly, you still, it's two years. Evan and Ro are, have been doing Buddha Buddha for like a year, right? Yeah. Um, even the dudes here with, uh, at the Refine, the Refine's existed for two years, or a year and a half. Mark and David with Alpha Rock, it's been like a year, yeah. right? Like it's just like, there's all these guys that are doing cool things and maybe you know, have a ton of experience in other business areas, but like in terms of the businesses that they're currently running, they're all, you know, one or two years or three years. Even for me, it's like four years. I'm still, still in a sort of startup phase, so it's like they're not so far away yeah. from, from those people. And yeah, I mean, I think anybody that takes the, I think there's always that common thread with people that move to China, Southeast Asia to start businesses. Like, it's a certain type of person. It's a person who's taken a risk. It's a lot of people that are all, in the mindset of you know the four-hour work week and digital nomad uh, mentality, so like there's an immediate camaraderie and connection that that kind of negates things. It doesn't really matter how old you are or your background. Like it's just like, and, and then also the other aspect of being a minority in the country, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, like expats just gravitate towards each other because you know how it is when you first when you first come to the country. Besides Zebra, who's a who also is like a highlight in terms of people that you met. Also, you, you forgot to mention Dylan, who you started a mastermind with. Yeah, I was gonna touch on that later, but yeah, like, yeah, that's, um, I guess that I can answer that in two parts. The first part, um, like, who, what other people that I met that, like, will last, um, this, this podcast will come out and, and uh, the video will come out, but I met uh, Alex really cool guy and the guys the whole guys from Alpha Rock I think uh, really made a lasting impression on me and of what's possible mm -hmm. and thinking outside of the box almost yeah um, and then yeah like just just everyone in general is, is really nice to meet um, and then the second part of that is the the mastermind aspect of it and then coming out and like meeting you and you explaining how you know, masterminds were an important part of, of your entrepreneurial journey. So, um, me and Vincent, uh, who's the other SFA intern, um, made a, a mastermind group along with Dylan, who uh, I met in Hong Kong um, through Nick Zebra. He was, was the intern uh, with Zebra. So, um, you know, we, we just started our mastermind, but it's definitely something that I definitely see value in and uh, really beneficial for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked. I talked. I think it was like, must have been the first week uh, of your internship when me, you, and Vincent went to get uh, shisha at Sultan. And then, uh, yeah, I think it was the end of the first week because I feel like it was like a Friday or whatever. Yeah. And then we sat down and I was, I don't know how the conversation went in that direction, but I was just like, yeah, I mean, a big, big thing for me was starting masterminds. My first mastermind was uh, my last last year in Toronto before I moved here. Yeah. Uh, hanging on in the frat house and stuff and it just gave me a perspective of how much you can accomplish in a week or even in a day in general because I you know before that I was sort of lazy and I would procrastinate a lot of things but when you have accountability when you have other people saying okay you want to make a website what's stopping you from making a website tomorrow well, well I don't have the code it's like no you know that this fucking WordPress and Squarespace like you don't have to really code anything. You just have to put in the information into the website and pick a pick a theme, right? Like it was like things like that. And I was like, okay, fuck, okay, I'll make a website next week. So it was like, yeah, you just learn what what's possible. And then of course the networking aspect. Um, 
it also structures and also I think masterminds also helped me structure how I structure the meetings in the company because especially if you do it correctly you're not spending a shit ton of time just talking about other random stuff you're saying okay we have three minutes to talk about this particular thing and that's and then you like you have three minutes three minutes three minutes and you say this is what I did last week this is what I've accomplished what I failed to accomplish is what I'm doing next week my one of my pet peeves is having meetings where there isn't a clear agenda set and then you end up like talking about you spend 20 minutes of the meeting talking about the actual agenda and then 30 40 minutes talking about other random stuff right like so masterminds also helped me with that in terms of structuring how I how I run meetings with people um, what's what's been your favorite uh, favorite place that you've been to because I think it's Hong Kong Boracay Manila Guangzhou Shenzhen it's just been quite a few of them. yeah um, I do I do really like uh, Manila it's been really nice it was nice a little bit of a tease of Boracay yep and it definitely gives you it gives you a taste for what the Philippines is and what it can like if you come back and spend more time here what it can be um, and yeah like I think all the places were just so different from one another it's hard to pick my favorite place um, but definitely just being able in the internship to travel um, as much as, as we did it was just really eye-opening to me and realizing like <laughs> how how a big it is and how much opportunity there are in each and every place yeah and also just the the proximity of all these countries right like you're talking about China like mainland to Hong Kong to a two-hour train ride you know uh, two-hour plane ride to Manila like if we went to Thailand it would have been a similar thing yeah you know and then within Manila itself it's like when we went to Boracay you're barely like in the air before you're descending right like it's like a it's a one-hour flight but I think it's more like 45 50 minutes yeah and I think the thing that struck me too is is the places are very close like a couple hours apart but they're just so different from one another right even from Guangzhou to Shenzhen yeah Hong Kong to Guangzhou Manila to China like it's it's just totally different worlds and you kind of have to adapt but different world different language it. different culture it's just very very different yeah um, what about your what's the biggest thing you learned specifically in the in the SFA internship um, there's been a lot um, probably the, the just the knowledge I have of sourcing um, has, has been, has been been huge like we were recording earlier today and like a lot of the stuff you were saying I was like yeah I know what he's gonna say next because I've been around you for the net last three months and it's stuff that I, I now know I have like it's knowledge that I know um, whether I, I'll use it or not it's still really good to know no matter what so um, that that's invaluable stuff that probably the biggest takeaway and then apart from that it's just being able to say that I've done, you know, email marketing, social media, uh, I set up the webinar, like all those kinds of things, me, like have, having that on my resume are all great skills that I could have done in another, another company, but not to the capacity and not um, with as much freedom as I did uh, during the internship. Yeah, it would have been much more restrictive, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of the stuff was stuff that we have framework for that we've done before, but it was also things that we haven't really focused on. Right? I don't know if I talked about this. Tell me if I've talked about this on the podcast or, or the video uh, on my YouTube channel. But a big part of the reason why I thought it was important to not just get a marketing intern, but to bring somebody else from the West, was because you know you want to be able to. There's there's a certain like cultural difference in terms of how marketing is done in China or in Asia as a whole, but specifically China, I would say, versus, you know, the West. So if I'm hiring somebody who's Chinese, they might be really good at, you know, doing marketing in China, but there's a lot of other things that I have to explain to them. Like, I always give this example. It's like, I remember when I had um, one of my older employees uh, who doesn't work with us anymore, but she was running, like, on social media, and uh, she would help me with filming sometimes. Um, she helped film like most of the day in the life day one day two. <clears throat> there would be certain things I would say like I want to I want to do like a Gary Vee style shot like right here. And she'd be like, who the fuck is Gary Vee? And I'm like, 
Gary V is just getting to watch this video. <laughs> like, so just like little things like that, where it's like uh, just cutting the learning curve, where you know we already consume a lot of the same set type of content. So me explaining, you know, I want to do like a vlog style shot or whatever. Like, I don't have to then explain what a vlog is. Yeah. Right. Like, so this this the that was a big thing. But then of course the communication is faster. Um, and then I think I think uh, giving back as well, like because. Yeah, I, I think there was definitely a little bit of a bias with you being from Canada, like when I was, <laughs> when I was looking at the interns from before, but it's just like, yeah, it's cool to be able to bring somebody and people that are hungry and want to come out to Asia, because I know what that felt like. I always said, like, I wish there was something like that when I was starting out, because I would have jumped at the opportunity. Um, but yeah, and then, and then uh, just in general, like, the benefit for me is that if I don't have to worry about the practical things and the logistics of setting up a shot or a filming or uh, reaching out to people, then I can be more creative. I can act in more of a sort of director role. So I mean, and that's kind of like, I don't know when this video is going to come out. It might be before, it's probably going to be before the day in the life uh, in Manila. But one thing you'll notice with the day in the life in Manila is like, I have less, I guess I have less communication with employees. Um, so I'm dealing less with the sort of operations within my business. I'm more so trying to set up things on a broader scale, which is the content stuff, um, which is business partnerships, like having business partners here in the Philippines, learning more about the manufacturing climate here in the Philippines, yeah. drumming up new business in the Philippines. Like I've, every single time I come here, I, I close sales like the first week that we were here, uh, started working with Jordan. Right, from it for this marketing, um, and then I've got a couple of stuff with with Alpha Rock that's gonna materialize in the next week, two weeks, three weeks, you know. So it's like, yeah, every time I every time I come here, I just expand uh, my business context and my knowledge and things like that. So same thing with the marketing side of things is if I'm not sitting down, like setting up the shot, pausing, changing the angle, things like that. And if I can just say, hey, Luke, let's try it like this, let's try it like that, then you raise the production value, and then I can also be more creative and think from a from a more high level perspective um, so yeah for me I mean it's been it's been hugely beneficial our last intern uh, Marcello was awesome however he got like sort of homesick and you know he left prematurely so it was good now to like have you know somebody actually complete the full internship and then on top of that like we were already working together before so it was, yeah it was like I think that's probably part of the reason is you're already sort of acclimatized to how we work, how we communicate. Yeah. Um, and then it was just about like just increasing the workload, really. Like, yeah. Because before I wasn't really giving you too much stuff to do. Yeah, exactly. You know, trying not to overwhelm you. Yeah. Um, what was the what's the what's the most difficult thing that you've done within within your work for SFA? What was the most challenging? Probably practicing the webinar, just because yeah. it was something I had no idea what I was getting into. I still have the recordings, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's something I had no idea what I was like. I would wake up in the morning and be like, what am I doing? Yeah. I was like, I, I feel like I'm an actor or something. <laughs> just because it was like just straight up rehearsal, like for a couple of days straight, like staying up like really late and waking up really early and practicing. but. At the end of it, I, I felt like super accomplished, and like I, I think I told you, I was like, I, yeah, I would do one again, like in a heartbeat, just because it was like such a grind, but the rush you get at the end is so rewarding. And then it helps if you close sales, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> it, helps if, it helps if you make some money from it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It is like being an actor. Like even, um, I mean, um, I try to be like as much of my myself on the YouTube and podcasts as much as possible. But there are certain aspects of, hey, let's set up the shot like this. Like I might be filming in a place that I don't usually hang out in, right? Like there's little yeah. little little aspects to that. Um, but yeah, specifically with presentations, it is because you're you have to come across as polished and, and confident, and also to keep people engaged. You again, you can't be like sort of stumbling your words and then not really knowing what to say and saying um and ah and you know it's like then people are like this guy doesn't know what he's talking about and also just people get you know frustrated or bored i was thinking i was thinking about it the other day when we were breaking down um how long the actual webinar is right yeah and i in my mind i know that the webinar is an hour and a half hour 45 
two hours with Q&A. But in my mind, the presentation aspect, I, I thought it was about 45 minutes. <laughs> it was literally an hour. Like it was, I think it was even a little bit more than an hour. And I was like, shit, man. To keep people engaged for like 60 minutes straight and you're yeah. just giving them a shit ton of information. Yeah, you really do have to like take the time to practice and practice and practice. So it's a very smooth uh, presentation and, and, and um, uh, transition between each slide and each, each part of the, each subject matter. In, in the safe method for that, for example. And then I, when I saw um, one of my other friends, Nick Ramil, who he was the first person that gave me advice on how to set up the webinar, um, I was talking to him about his presentations, because at this stage he's, he's done presentations pretty much all over Southeast Asia, sometimes to you know 100 plus people in the crowd. Um, and he was just like, it's repetition, man. Like, first of all, you, t you have to talk about something that you know. That's the first thing. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the knowledge, then it's going to be difficult. But talk about something that you know, but then just fucking repetition, 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 practice, practice, practice. Because then once you have that and you know exactly what you're going to say, then you feel comfortable and you feel confident when you're, when you're doing it. Yeah. Um, so webinar is the most challenging. Was there anything that was particularly difficult to, to understand or to, to do? or uh, Like outside of the webinar? Yeah, outside of the webinar. Um, I mean, I did have a, a bit of experience before this, but like from the marketing standpoint, if you're familiar with Instagram, if you're familiar with Facebook, if you're familiar, as you said earlier, like with a lot of the stuff we already do in the West, it's it comes pretty easy. I think the, the biggest thing is just managing it all and like being like, okay, like we're filming this day, so plan out your schedule here or... You know, we're doing this this day, so, like, it's not always, like, your typical 9 to 5. So, at first, it was just, like, juggling the the whole, like, how everything is going to be done in a timely manner, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I think that that's the part that I, I found the toughest. But from a work point of view, yeah, I think that the biggest thing... And the biggest learning curve for me was the the webinar, setting it up, the emails, just because it was something so foreign to me. But you know, I feel confident in my abilities now that I've done it once. I could I could easily do it again. You know. And I remember, um, I think it was after the first when we did the first uh, monthly review. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you you yeah you were telling me like uh, it's fucking it's, it's a lot. <laughs> like, yeah. Because you're like you didn't know how to sort of pack in your, your days and, and fill out like what am I going to do from this time to this time to this time and I, I think the first review we did was in Hong Kong if I remember correctly mm -hmm. right? um, and my advice to you was just basically to try to break up your day into sections yeah um, did you start to did you start to implement that I've definitely uh, started doing that I mean after the webinar we, we did go to Boracay and everything so um, yeah, like the last two weeks have been pretty. Yeah, it's been pretty chill. Pretty chill. Pretty chill yeah. But uh, there's always the plan. Always, always like. But like you know, like yeah, like uh, the last, like you know, this morning and the last couple of days, I've I've woken up earlier and then definitely uh, implement. And there's definitely things that you know back home. I'm going. I'm definitely taking away with me, and uh, definitely implementing in my in my routine. And it's just part of what I'm taking away from the internship too. Of, is how to, you know, structure my routine to be a a better worker, but also it's like how to be more successful as an entrepreneur. What uh, did you manage? Did you manage employees before? Like, had you managed freelancers and things like that? I never managed freelancers, but I, I like I, I've worked before, um, like at a community center and managing different staff and that kind of stuff. But what was it like? working with people that are completely remote um, so when i say that i'm talking about our, our podcast editor casey superstar and uh house of lord entertainment our youtube youtube video editor yeah no it's both of them are super great yeah you can't you can't talk shit because he's editing <laughs> uh, i see you lord um uh, <laughs> no uh it's both of them are super chill and super nice um sometimes you just feel like you're like ah why do I have to type this out? I just want to call them. But it also forces you to be like, okay, like, 
I really need, and it, it, it's, it's still a learning curve for me, um, because you'll tell me something, and your vision, and uh, like we, we talk about the vision of, of the video, and it's it's writing that down, that vision down, so that they can understand it. That's a bit of a challenge at times, but it's something that I'm I'm continually getting better at, and the more I like, the more I do it, and the more I get feedback from Lord and Casey on how they want it or how how things can be easier for them, I'll, I'll get better at it. Yeah, I remember. Um, when did you start taking over some of the communication with? Because I think you started doing a little bit before you arrived. But for me, that was like one of the first things. Like when you arrived, I was like, I want you to take over all the, the, the day-to-day communication. -day communication. Yeah. I'll still jump in from time to time. Yeah, it was probably like June, June, June 1st. You started working on like a few. I think, yeah, there was a few situations where I was like, maybe I was busy, I was traveling or something. And I just yeah. asked you, can you review this video? Get yeah, back to And I remember like, um, it was uh, it was obviously very obvious to me the, the contrast in terms of how you were giving feedback versus how I give feedback. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, you're gonna have to like start first of all giving timestamps and then like sort of just num like listing out the the changes you wanna have. Yeah, made. yeah. It's easier for people to understand. And then yeah, I think you started doing that maybe like two months ago, a month and a half ago. I yeah. Started to, I started to notice that the feedback was more. Um, clear and concise for them to understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 always a learning curve, and um, but it's also been like super beneficial too. I mean, I was talking to Gerard uh, when on uh, the podcast that I did with Gerard Newen Heiss, uh That's out right now, so you're gonna check it out. Uh, he runs a completely remote team, and he was talking about the same thing. It was like sometimes people want to hop on a call. Right to give you because they feel like the feedback is faster. Yeah. But when you are not in the same office, jumping on a call, you really think to yourself like, okay, is this information that I need? Is it so important that I have to call this person right now? Yeah. It makes you think twice, and then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna write like a message in Slack or an email instead, or or send a text message. Um, so I think yeah, it's 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 interesting because that's the same thing with me. Is like I was so used to having employees in the office. And just turning around and saying, "Hey, you know, can you work on this, this, and that?" And when I started working with these guys remotely, it was like it really forced me to, you know, figure out how can I get my point across to somebody who's not that I can't just pick up a, a phone call and I pick up a phone and call them. Um, although sometimes I will leave like voice messages on on WhatsApp instead. Yeah, I think what I've what I've learned um, is is that like you can leave a voice note or voice message but it's still better to have also that text representation just because it'll help them understand it even more right? yeah so that's what i would usually do is like if uh, if i feel like it's going to take too long for me to completely type out everything that i'm trying to say i will put the bullet points the main points that i'm saying and then i'll expand on it through, yeah. through voice message or i'll just follow up on something through voice message so like yeah yeah I think it's. I think that's a huge skill set that a lot of people don't realize. Is you know how do you manage people when you're not physically with them all the time? Yeah. How do you communicate effectively to people that are in a completely different country from you? Yeah. Um, and then working with people in different time zones and things like that. Like that's something that I'm now trying to develop. Where I'm like thinking to myself. I've been thinking about this for a while. I was like, I don't know if we. I don't know if we should have an office, man. I feel like I was talking to Gerard. And he doesn't have an office, and it's just like hasn't made any difference, right? Yeah. We do need a physical location to meet clients and and to receive samples, but it's like if I'm going to be spending less time in China, it's like it's kind of a pointless yeah thing. And having employees in different parts of China, different countries, and things like that. You know. All right, so we had to change positions, get the uh, the BGC skylight in the background. It's a little bit windy, so the camera might shake a bit, but podcast is almost done. Um, so I guess one of, one of the other things, one of the other things I wanted to ask, what would you say if uh, somebody else was thinking, hey, Luke, I'm trying to, I'm thinking about going to Southeast Asia um, or, or China specifically, what would be your perspective now? What would you say to them? Um, I would say definitely go to Guangzhou, <laughs> but no, that's probably just a bias, but um, yeah. If you're going to China, I would say just um, 
try to get as prepared as you can, um, downloading all the apps. Um, yeah, downloading all the apps. Um, and then in terms of like, people are scared or not, don't be scared, just do it. You won't regret it. Um, and and the, the amount of stuff that you're gonna learn just being on the ground in China, uh, either as an entrepreneur or working for a company is gonna be invaluable in the future. So honestly, uh, Vincent and I talked about this in, in our kind of podcast thing is just like, just do it. Yeah. Um, Cause you won't regret it. And the, the amount of things you learn is A, gonna be humbling and, and really invaluable, but also you're gonna take a lot away from it that you'll be able to apply in whatever situation life throws at you in the future. What about, uh, is there anything that you wish you knew before you came? Uh, really, no. I was just... Uh, in terms I, of preparation or anything like that? No, because I feel I was, like, you prepared me well before coming. So it was, I mean, maybe that China is more expensive than I thought. <laughs> but that's that like that's that's a, a, little, a little side thing like really I think it's not China it's well China is more expensive than it used to be yeah it's also where you where you were living yeah that's like if you lived in um, in Haiju or even some other parts outside of the, the area near the Jujua New Town like yeah it's, it's very cheap yeah, yeah. but um, no like I again I, I came in with like not expecting anything and I left with like things that will like last me a lifetime. So I don't think I could have been more prepared than I was. What have your friends and family been saying about your experiences? I mean, from from what I the little I've told, I haven't been able, like I haven't really sat down with them and told them everything. I think that will come in the next coming months. But from what they hear, they're really happy for me and. They want to come out too, just to see all the places that I've seen. But also, I think this is both friends. And, well, that's some serious camera shaking right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's both friends and family, or your friends specifically? My friends specifically, yeah. um, family too, but to a lesser extent. I think my, I think uh, my my family is more just excited and happy for me that I've really met some cool people. But also, like an opportunity like this has also opened more opportunities, so I think they're more excited for that aspect too. So what's the plan uh, when you get back to Canada? I have, it's it, like, as I said at the beginning, like I, it really hasn't sunk in that I'm going back. Um, like I, I will be uh, staying, <laughs> I don't know how, how much I can say, but I, I really want to stay on. Well, you'll be, you'll be still, yeah. you know, involved what we the in terms of the level of involvement we haven't 100 percent decided but we yeah. still want to keep you on but at least capacity. at least at least doing the part-time thing keeping up the communication with lord um and and the, the social media aspect of it and then um in terms of the rest of the stuff it's just i'll, I'll be figuring out what my next move my next career moves are um, that'll be the the most immediate thing when I get back. But uh, yeah, just I guess <laughs> protesting everything that I've learned in the last like a uh, couple of months and being able to have the time to reflect a bit more on it. In a perfect scenario, how quickly would you get back to Southeast Asia? Uh, I'd like to. I'd. L I would love to come back here as soon as possible. Really, um, it's just figuring out how I can make that happen. Right. So it's just. Uh, yeah, again, it's just like I realize like the opportunities here and the advantages of being here and especially like starting off your entrepreneurial journey, which is, is what I'm doing. So, you know, I would, I would just want to spend as much time as I can here. Could you see yourself like, let's say, um, you know, obviously the, the stuff that we'll be doing is probably part time. Obviously, I can change in the future. But let's say you had the part time thing. Um, you go back, you'll have a couple gigs in, in Canada, you save up some money. Yeah. Would you see yourself in a position where you're like, okay, fuck, I'm just going to go teach English for you know, three months while working on side projects, six months or whatever? That yeah, is. I mean, yes, I, I definitely would. I mean, those side projects would have to be significant so that I wouldn't be so, so bored teaching English. 
Um, but I also know that I, I love a place like Manila more than I like China. So I don't know yeah. if I'd want to spend that long. But um, I definitely know that I want to be in Southeast Asia, whether it be China or, or Manila, um, doing something that I like. I, I want to be starting something or helping something out. Um, and, and that'd be something like I'm really passionate about. So um, I think that's, that's the approach I kind of want to take for the future. Yeah, I mean, there's still, um, I think there's still ways that you're going to work that out. For example, I know one of, one of my friends before, he would like teach English in China for like two months, then go and like stay in the Philippines or Thailand for five months because you could save up quite yeah. a bit of money. Or there's some people that I know that have done like virtual teaching. Oh, that's true. Um, but you have to, the best way to do that is you physically uh, meet the schools in China. Yeah. And you set it up and then you leave. Yeah. Like it's much more difficult if you're trying to, you know, send them a resume online and whatever. So there's like a lot of, a lot of different ways you could find angle being in, in the Philippines or whatever country uh, while still, you know, kind of being China adjacent. Um, all right. So any, any final thoughts, man? Um... No, again, again, I think like a lot of my final thoughts will come at the end of the internship and once everything's over. But uh, yeah, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity, and I I want to thank you for everything that you've taught me and everything that you've done, and uh, something that I'm always going to remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's a couple of places specifically you're always going to remember. Yeah, All right, man, it's good. It's been good. If you guys like this kind of content, uh, like, comment, share, subscribe, 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 and I will see you guys next week. Cheers.